most of my time uh, here in Delhi, but have been to probably 15 or 20 cities and have engaged in occupationally related activities from the red rock mines of Rajasthan to steel mills in Vizag to uh, another steel mill uh, uh, that I went to from uh, Mangalore for a visit, Hyderabad, Dehradun, I've been the length and breadth of the country, Calcutta, Mumbai, but my, my home is here in Delhi, so uh, this is where I feel most comfortable and have been many times. And it's truly an honor to be at Ames. I mean, this is the institution that worldwide is known as the best place for medicine in all of India. Uh, I've met Ames trained physicians. Uh, I'm, I'm with many of you that now are here at Ames, and it's uh, meaningful and important to me to be here. It's my first time here today, and, and uh, uh, I'm honored to be here. So you've heard a little bit about my history. Yes, I'm a graduate of the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, but talk about new opportunities. I was in the very first class when the brand new medical school opened in 1968. They'd never had a medical student before. They had some trainees, I guess, from other institutions, but they didn't have a medical school. Uh, it had been a pretty well-known hospital. It had opened in 1852 and uh, they finally got around to starting a medical school in 1968 so there were only 36 of us in the first batch uh, we added some more in the clinical years anyway a different set of training we go to undergraduate university for four years and then medical school for four years it's a little different than the kind of training you got and i'm a little bit in awe of the fact that here you are medical people getting a degree and being trained in uh, uh, the administrative aspect of medicine. I knew early on that I wanted to be uh, an academic physician. That, that was my bent. I had started doing research as a high school student. I published my first paper working in a cancer research hospital connected with the university that I was at the, uh, for my undergraduate work, which interestingly was in anthropology, not in one of the hardcore sciences. And got accepted to this first class, but in American medicine, in American medical schools, there is no training in the kinds of training that you're getting. In fact, if I wanted to get administrative training as a physician, I would either have to go to a school of public health, which is where I teach now, along, being, along with being a professor of medicine and a professor of environmental engineering, because I work with the environmental engineers, or one would have to go get what we have is like an MHA, Masters of Hospital Administration. And most of those people are not medical people. They're truly trained in administration. You start seeing now in America that many, not many, but physicians who want to go into administration, they don't do a program like yours. They go get an MBA, a Masters of Business Administration. Uh, so... From my own experience, having said that I was a, uh, an academic, what does it mean to be an academic physician in almost any setting? It means you have to teach. Where in medical school do the professors learn how to be teachers? You don't get trained. You learn by doing. As a department head and of the four universities that I've worked at uh, as a faculty member, at three of them I've been a department head. What do department heads do? They manage budgets. Where do you get trained in budgeting? You don't get trained in budgeting because that's not part of medical education. All right. You deal with personnel. You have to hire, fire, uh, write up people, uh, give them annual reviews. This is all part of what you do as an administrator, what I had to do as a department head. Do we get trained to do that? No. As an academic, you're trained to publish and write in scientific journals. Where do you learn to write papers? Again, that's not part of training in medical education. So I'm, I'm, I'm almost, uh, not really in a sense, jealous of the opportunities you have to learn about these things because I was extraordinarily fortunate. Because we were such a small class, we were, you know, the, the first, there were ten times more faculty, fifteen times more faculty than there were students. And so many of the faculty we got to know rather intimately. 
They knew us, we knew them. And it was the head of the Department of Community Medicine, which is where administrative kinds of things, if it lay anywhere, would lay there. A gentleman by the name of Dr. Kurt Duschel, who interestingly enough, if you've ever wondered where the term community medicine came from, he was the physician in America that used that term for the first time. Prior to that, everything was a department of preventive medicine. In Great Britain, it was social medicine. When he started a new medical school at the University of Kentucky, that was in 1960, he said, it's really more than prevention. I can't use the term social medicine because in America, social and socialism, that's a bad word, we can't use it. We're a capitalistic, non-socialistic society, so you have to be careful what you name things. So he came up with the term community medicine. And he required every student in a clinical year, I mean, we did two years of basic sciences, two years of clinical sciences. Community medicine was considered a clinical science. But we focused on populations, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But he required every student to do a community-based project, to get out there and assess a community. Now, he left Kentucky uh, in about 1968, and where did he go? He started another brand new medical school called Mount Sinai and started the Department of Community Medicine there. And I was so fortunate because he took me under his wing and even though you know, we had no such formal training, informally he took me in and what did he do with me? He had me sit with his business manager days before computers. She had big ledger books teaching me how to balance budgets. He sent me to his vice chair who handled administrative matters and he would talk to me about how do you hire, fire, what do you look for in colleagues, how do you have a vision of putting things together. I had an almost one person type education and considered myself really very fortunate, which, you know, not to show off, but when I was 36 years old and I'd done my two residencies, I'd finished my PhD and I'd only been an academic for six years, I got asked to start at the age of 36 as a full professor, a new department of preventive medicine and environmental health. So it, it was in part, I'm sure, because I'd had this kind of training and it was because of Dr. Duschel's recommendation who gave them my name, which I didn't find out for three years, that he said I was ready to, to, to run a department. So. That's a little bit uh, about the personal background, but I'll share another aspect. Here you are, you're physicians, you're, you're learning how to be administrators. The most important person in my life is my wife. And uh, an interesting lady, very bright in, in many ways. And uh, she had always wanted to be a high school math teacher. That was her goal, but she was the oldest of six children in a very conservative family and women were not supposed to get educated. They were only going to get married and have babies and they were only going to educate her four brothers and not she and her sister. But they said to her, you can choose two things that will help support. You can become a secretary or you can become a nurse. Well, she thought for about two seconds and she said, I don't want to be a secretary. At least nursing has some science in it. She was a very bright lady. And she asked around in, in America, she says, what's the single best nursing school in the United States? This was the late 1960s. And everybody said, Johns Hopkins has the best nursing school. She made one application. She got in. She was a Johns Hopkins trained nurse. She nursed at several institutions, and I had the good fortune. There I was, the newly minted, freshly graduated doctor on my first assignment in the hospital as an internal medicine first-year resident. And she was the new head nurse. So who knew more medicine? Of course she did. She'd been a, around for a while, worked in ICUs, had worked at Columbia University, worked at the Harvard hospitals, and now was at Mount Sinai. She had better credentials than I did. But she took herself back to school. She got her math degree. She went to work for Bell Laboratories. That was the research arm that, if you know anything about the, you know, who invented the transistor? It was Bell Laboratories. Who put electronic phone systems in place? That was the Bell system, et cetera, et cetera. And she got a job there, having been sent by one of her uh, professors to, to interview there. And they said, you only have a bachelor's degree in math, 
And they said, you have to have at least a master's or doctorate to sort of uh, really work here. So we'll send you, which one do you want? She said, I wasn't ready for a PhD. She said, I'll, I'll do a, a, a master's. And she went to engineering school and gets a degree in operations research. So I'm sure that sort of impacts your curriculum to a certain extent. You have to learn how things run. And this was why we were still in New York. But then I get the job in Kentucky, and she comes. And she gets hired by one of the community hospitals. And with her background in nursing and math and operations research and the telephone company, she becomes the internal sort of industrial engineer, puts in a new phone system, puts the first computer system into the hospital. When the doctors come and say, we want to start a new clinic, she sets up all the programming of how do you integrate the clinic and the nurses and how much staff do you need. So there, is people, there are people like yourselves that get training. But as I sh started this, I didn't have training for any of this. You sort of learn it. And, you know, administrative work is not for everybody. And I spent 30-plus years of my career as a department head at three universities. Finally, at the end of my career, and I should have retired years ago, at least by age, but I'm still working and still enjoying it, I said enough of the administrative things having done that, and I got back to being just a professor. The first year or so after giving it up, I started publishing again. Even last year, I think I had eight or ten publications, so you can still be productive when you don't have all the administrative things. That said, running a facility also becomes very important because nothing works right if you don't run it right. So that's a little bit by way of introduction. So let me, uh, introduction. I come from the field of occupational and environmental medicine. Okay? I learned as we were talking beforehand, all of you had to do some clinical work before you got into a program like this. Okay? So when I, I, I joined the faculty at Mount Sinai, it was my first the position for six years. I continued to both see, we had a very interesting experience. As third year medical students, we were assigned to the internal medicine clinic, even if we weren't going into internal medicine, which I did. And we all got our own panel of patients. And so for my years in medical school, for my years of training uh, in the hospital, every Thursday morning I went to the clinic and saw internal medicine patients. And then even when I became a faculty member in occupational medicine, one day a week, Thursday mornings, I would go see occupational or uh, internal medicine patients. And at least one month a year, I would take a rotation on the internal medicine service uh, as an attending teaching the house staff. So it was a good grounding for what I did. But, but mostly what I do is work in the field of occupational medicine. And what separates occupational medicine from every other field of medicine is that it's the only specialty and in America we have I don't know 35 uh, 36 different medical specialties every one of them deals with patients one by one by one except preventive medicine where we look at populations now do I still and have I seen patients on a one by one basis of course I do but we think population you know how do we know that substance A causes disease B how do we know if Treatment A is better than treatment B for the same disease because you deal with it in populations. So preventive medicine, which is under the even broader rubric of public health, uh, is what I do. Now, a little history. Uh, I will venture to say that I probably am not wrong when I say any of you that have gone to medical school here in India had almost no training or no training in occupational medicine or how to take an occupational history. And so I've been coming to India and, and at least since 2005 training in the, uh, the DG Fastly course, the uh, uh, AFIH program to train occupational physicians in here, here in India. I had the great pleasure last night, one of the people I trained last year uh, came to see me yesterday evening, was doing very well. And, loving the fact that he changed from being a pulmonologist. And my interest has been pulmonary disease, so it, it, it fits quite well. But this gentleman is a fellow named Bernardino Ramazzini. He's the father of my field, occupational medicine. He was born in 1633 in a little town in northern Italy called Carpi. It's still there. 
Um, there's an organization named after him, the Collegium Ramazzini. It's a scientific organization. I've had the privilege of uh, being elected as a, as a fellow there. But this is his bus. The building that it sits next to is the City Hall of Carpi. Uh, we have an annual scientific meeting that meets there. But he added a single question to the medical armamentarium that we all get trained. I mean, what's the most important aspect of medicine? Getting a history. Now, here in India, I've learned that with the number of patients you see, you might have two or three minutes, and so you have to be very quick about what's wrong. This is the problem. This is what you take. One of the reasons I became an academic is I didn't want to practice particularly that way. I didn't want to be run by insurance companies that you have to see the patients in seven minutes or new patients in 15 minutes. And some occupational health problems, which is a talk for another time, could take an hour to get to the bottom of why somebody developed arsenic poisoning or why they developed another disease that was related to some exposure that nobody else could think about. So he, he added a question, and the question was, ask of the common man what he does for a living. And that's really been expanded from just work site exposures to environmental exposures. You live and work here in a city with one of the most serious air pollution problems at times of the year. I've been here at almost every time of the year, so I understand that as an issue. Uh, we all live in an environment. How many hundreds of millions of people work and how many doctors know how to ask somebody about their job? Very few. How many people live in an environment? Everybody. But what training does one get? So as you think about programs and, and initiatives in hospital settings, think about this field. So educationally, uh, it's an underappreciated area, especially you know how many people work and how many live in an environment. So where, in fact, is something like occupational and the world uh, has adopted a longer-term occupational and environmental medicine? Why? Because if you're working with a hazardous material and it seeps out into the air, does it stop at the factory gates? No, it goes out into the environment. If it ends up in the water supply, does it stop as the water pipe gets to the edge of the factory gate? No, it goes out into the community. So it's really now occupational and environmental medicine. And where is that practice? At corporate workplaces. Most of the doctors that I've trained over the years, both in America and, and certainly here in India, end up in corporate medicine. Um, you know, I've, I've been to plants where the doctor will come over to me and the training here, whereas my training had to do a year of clinical work and then two more years in occupational medicine. Um, they do a three-month course and are now qualified as, a, as an occupational physician. They've come over to me and said, I was in your class in 2016 or one of them in 2005 and because of you, I'm now in this field and you know working here. So I, I've... I've felt very good about having some influence here besides the people I've trained back in America. So many people end up at workplaces. We have freestanding occupational medicine clinics where small industries who don't have enough money or uh, personnel to justify either uh, an occupational physician or something that you don't even have in this country, occupational health nurses, I've addressed the nursing school over at Nancy as well, and they'd never heard of occupational health nursing. There are more occupational health nurses in America than there are occupational physicians, and a lot of them work in small corporations. But these freestanding clinics will aggregate you know, dozens and dozens of small places and make themselves available to provide services. Sometimes other kinds of practices will incorporate occupational medicine. For example, you're probably aware in America we have uh, uh, you know, freestanding uh, urgent care centers. They're not full-fledged emergency rooms. They're just, you know, if you're sick, you, you don't feel well, your tummy hurts, you might need a vaccination, you go to these urgent care centers, and they may have somebody there who uh, part-time does some occupational oversight. But there are also hospital-based programs. Any big university hospital... Most, most hospitals, but certainly, let's say, the university hospitals, a place like this, will have an internal uh, 
occupational health program that looks after the health and well-being of the doctors, the nurses, every employee at the hospital, environmental health staff, your kitchen staff, everybody can use the clinic at the hospital. You, depending on your exposures, one at, at Drexel University, I serve as co-chair of the Biosafety Committee. Graduate students that work with hazardous materials, with carcinogenic chemicals, with uh, uh, altered viruses that they may be sticking in animals or cell cultures, they have to come in on a regular basis and have uh, clinical examinations. Uh, but sometimes these hospital-based programs set up clinics, as I did at the University of Kentucky, when I got there, there was no occupational health clinic. So what did I set up? I set up an occupational health clinic. We set up a general preventive medicine clinic. So what's that? For people who wanted sort of lifestyle kinds of changes. You know, they wanted advice about their diets. Uh, we had a member on the staff who did aviation exams. You know, to be a pilot, you have to have a special aviation kind of exam. So we had somebody on staff who could do that. We had a travel clinic for people that were traveling overseas that needed vaccinations or, or would call up and say, you know, what shots do I need to go to the Gambia? You know, they could come and see us. So we operated within the hospital complex and the medical school, uh, a clinic that not only saw uh, hospital personnel but others. And we went out and we accumulated as part of our little world um, uh, small companies who could send their cases to us either on an emergent basis, somebody got hurt, or for pre-employment exams. There's a whole world of the kinds of exams that get done in occupational medicine. Pre-employment, injury exams, return to work exams, exit exams. I mean, the military does this all the time. You get examined when you go in and you get examined when you leave. Why? Because they want to know, did we cause the problem or were you healthy when you left? Uh, because they're worried about compensation. We would deal with compensation activities. The other things departments like that do, and it's something that I've done for 40 plus years of my career, is medical legal work for injured workers. How many physicians do you know that if they hear the word compensation immediately head in the other direction? They want no part of it, they want no part of litigation, but people like me, this is part of what we do. And so there are opportunities to think about doing uh, litigation-related exams. The only thing I would say to you, you can do it for companies, and I've done that. I've set up, we'll talk about that, setting up medical programs for a company where they had no program. Uh, I do it for people that have been, been injured. The only rule that I will tell you, and I have no doubt that you would uh, understand this, the only thing you can be is honest about it. And at the end of the day, while there's a certain tension between employers and employees, in occupational medicine, if you stop for just an instant and think about it, workers want a safe and healthy workplace. They don't want to be injured. They don't want to get disease at the end of their work career. Companies want a healthy and productive workforce. They don't want people that are injured and out or leave because then they have to train new people up to do their job, and that costs them money. So everybody has an interest, even if you're on opposite sides, and maybe you're going to argue over you know, your pay or, or working conditions or vacation time, but you shouldn't be arguing over health because everybody wants that, in a sense, in the same way. So this is where occupational medicine is practiced. The other thing that I've learned is that every place has its own local culture. I told you that I was an anthropology major as an undergraduate. Mostly I did what's called physical anthropology. So I can go back and tell you that man's ancestors go back to a little squirrel-like creature 72 million years ago that was called a plesiodapidae. You don't care about that, nor should you. But I also learned about cultural anthropology. You know, when I come to India, you have different cultural norms in some ways. I mean, some basic norms are the same all over the world. And no matter where I've traveled, Everybody wants, if you ask them at their, at their base, what do you want out of life? You want your health, you want a roof over your family, you want your family to be safe and a little bit of food on the table. And I figure after that, everything else is extra. And if you can give people you know, work, a roof, and some food, and keep them healthy, that's basically what people want. 
and that doesn't matter where you are. But how that's done and what the culture is and the norms varies. Even within workplaces, I've spent time, uh, I'll talk to you about setting up a, a health program for a coal company. Now, if you know anything about, again, the culture of work, coal miners who work underground, they do not, like sailors traditionally, they do not like outsiders in their environment. Coal miners do not want an outsider coming into their workspace. Sailors don't want outsiders being on their ships when they're out at sea. So I occasionally, because I worked with a coal company, I'll tell you about setting that up, would go underground. I remember my very first day, I took my camera, and uh, the mine superintendent, the person in charge of the mine, you'll be hospital superintendents one day in charge of the hospital. Well, he ran the mine. And somebody came over and asked him a question. He got his calculator out, and he was starting to work. And he said, nah, Charlie, he said, see me after your shift outside, outside the mine. So I went over to Virgil, who was the super, and I said, uh, I'm sorry if my presence here is getting in the way of you talking with your uh, 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 workers here. He says, Doc, it has nothing to do with you. He says, I couldn't give him an answer. This is a solar-powered calculator. It doesn't work so well underground. So uh, you have to understand the culture of where you are. Uh, so again, even within India, no matter where you end up, in what organization, there's going to be a culture of that organization, and you have to be aware of that. So grossly, occupational medicine is an underserved area worldwide, with a few exceptions. In Europe, they've had a longer history of being aware of occupational medicine. In some countries like Italy, and I visited some of these hospitals, hospitals for workers, 200 bed hospitals that all they do is deal with workers and their health. In Mongolia, interestingly enough, a country with only 3 million people, I mean, that's the size of a large village around here, you know, 3 million people. Uh, the whole country, it's, it's the least populated country in the world. They have a whole set of clinics devoted to occupational health and everybody in the country who thinks or has to be evaluated for an occupational health problem comes to the occupational health clinic in the capital, Ulaanbaatar, where half the population of the country lives anyway. It's a country of 3 million people and 50 million sheep. And very unusual sort of situation. So other than Europe, where they have some of these hospitals and a, and a longer tradition, it goes back to uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution when uh, the first, besides Ramazzini, who wrote the first textbook in 1700, then the British started writing textbooks in the 1800s. Um, it's an underserved area, even in America. So there's a total lack of manpower, person power, particularly physicians, but you need to be uh, keep in mind that, at least in America, we have other kinds of uh, healthcare personnel. Again, I've, I've not run into them here in India or most other places, physician assistants. You know, a certain level of medical training, they have to work under the supervision of a physician. Physician extenders is a term that's sometimes used. Uh, that's something that, that could be thought about as, as additional training. Nurse practitioners. Nurses can be trained at certain levels, from bedside nursing to uh, quasi-independent practitioners, again, under a doctor's supervision. And then we even have a specialty of occupational health nursing. And they work in small companies that don't have enough employees or enough money to hire a physician, either full-time or part-time. So they're, the nurses are there. They're going to do the safety inspections. They'll, they'll do first aid. They'll judge if you need to go to the hospital to get better care. But there are a lot of ancillary fields that go along with occupational health. You need safety personnel. You need industrial hygienists. These are people who go out and measure chemical levels in the workplace or noise. Uh, there's radiation physics. You, you deal with those inside hospitals. If you've got any kind of uh, radioactive chemicals that you're doing for testing, you need a radiation physicist as part of your team. If you're going to do radiation therapy, you know, those are people trained with, and, and you have radiation sources. Re ergonomics, person-machine interactions. How do you design a workplace so that it's uh, uh, properly operated and then toxicology is a field that has input to this 
I'm reminded of one other situation. I, I told you I trained at Mount Sinai and I was there for, for many years. It was about 15 years altogether. And um, they renovated one of the floors to make a whole floor for just cancer care. Built nice rooms. They didn't call an architect in. I mean, this is because any architect who knew something about uh, uh, hospital settings would have picked up on this. If they'd asked any of the medical personnel working on the floors, they would have figured this out. But somebody designed a new hospital floor for cancer patients. Now, what is it that, that cancer patients, but every other patient, occasionally has? They either bring stuff up or they ooze stuff out and they use bedpans and they use other equipment that needs to be cleaned. And on this newly renovated floor, they didn't put in a bedpan cleaner. Every other floor in the hospital that had been there for years had bedpan cleaners so the staff could wash them out and reuse them. But somebody had designed a new floor. So even down to the level of that kind of equipment needs to be thought about in uh, renovating spaces. So as I've already told you, my experience includes setting up clinics within hospital structures. And I've told you about setting up the clinics at, at uh, Kentucky. When I took a job in Texas, that was actually, uh, I became the vice president for medical education and ran the Department of Medical Education and was responsible for all of the training, uh, graduate medical education and so forth. But the head of the occupational medicine program had been one of my earlier trainees. So it was a funny situation. Technically, I reported to him as my clinical department head, and he reported to me for his educational programs. But before I took the job, I said, Jeff, I mean, you know, we'd, we'd been together for years. I said, Jeff, you know, do you have any problem of me being your boss in one setting and you being my boss in another setting? He says, if I thought I would, I would never have asked you to come look at the job. So... You know, again, every culture has its own situation. But this was a department that didn't have big industry nearby, but had a lot of little industry. So we had 110 different companies that had signed contracts to use our hospital and the occupational medicine clinic as a place to send their workers, pre-employment exams, injury, return to work, all of that. So we constantly had workers coming to our full-time occupational medicine clinic, which met every morning and every afternoon. Um, and so even within a hospital setting, that's a service that, that can be provided. But I've also set up medical programs at companies. A coal company came to me, the medical director. It's an international company. They had six mines in eastern Kentucky. And they said the local doctors, is a very rural area, all they know to do is prescribe narcotics. That, that's all they do pretty much. It was the highest use of narcotics any place in the United States was the couple of counties that, that these mines existed in, because coal miners get injured a lot. So he says, I want to set up a medical program, and I can't find a local doctor that I trust, so at the university, can you set up a medical program for us? I said, sure. So how did I do that? It was a two and a half hour drive, but on site, I hired two very experienced occupational physician assistants. They worked five days a week. You know, we're on call after hours and weekends for emergencies. They ran the clinic. We had a nurse there. We had a, uh, she did the secretarial work. The two guys worked. And I would go down once a week and oversee them. Uh, and, but I would also go out to the mine site and uh, evaluate the workplace. The one thing about occupational medicine, it's not a specialty, you can sit in your office with your stethoscope around your neck and your white coat on your body and do occupational medicine. You have to go out and look at workplaces. So if you're ever going to set up a program, either you hire somebody to do it who goes out and does this, or you go out and take a look too. So I've set up a medical department. I was responsible for a thousand minors. They never had a baseline medical exam. And because they were digging coal out of the ground in both underground mines and strip mines, they didn't want to lose production, so they said, we want you to examine all of our 1,000 miners. We want you to do it on three shifts, and we want you to do it so no miner is away from his job for the exam more than two to three hours. So I brought a big team of people. We worked three shifts. We took a 
portable x-ray van out to the mine site, set it up. The guys would come in, they'd get their x-rays, they'd get their pulmonary function, we'd get a medical history, we'd draw bloods. We got it all done within the three-hour time limit. We ended up writing a thousand letters back to each miner telling them what the results of their exams were. Uh, and so uh, after that, once we had the baselines done, we had records on every miner when they came in and could uh, advise them. And we would advise them about other things. I guess we, I think we did cardiograms too. Toyota, they built their first automobile plant 25 minutes away from the university. They came to the university in Kentucky and said, there's two things we want. We want help with robotics, so the university built a robotics center for the engineers, and we want help with occupational medicine. And so I wrote the higher in exam, 18 pages of medical credential or medical uh, testing that you had to do and what levels you had to meet to get hired in. I set up the medical department. I was their acting medical director as they were building their plan. They offered me a job working there. So stock options, a new car every six months, a much bigger paycheck than the university. I had two little kids at the time, didn't even have the third kid yet. Went to my wife and I said, look, I've got this offer. She asked me one question. Would you be happy? And I said, probably not because my heart's in academics. So she said, then don't do it. So I stayed as an academic. And, you know, the, the most, I think the, the biggest decision we all have to make in our lives, maybe after our career choice, is getting somebody at home to help us and support us through our work. I, I'll, I'll just leave that out there. So I, I helped set up the medical department. Could have become a corporate medical director. Uh, so I had that kind of experience. So I've had some experience in industry. I've trained doctors at MAMSI. I've worked and taught and lectured over the years in the ESI system. I've been involved in corporate uh, settings and I've had some training experiences for labor management groups and uh, lectured about that. Uh, and you know, other countries that I visited when I was in Mongolia, there was a company opening a uh, copper mine out at the edge of the Gobi Desert and went out there and lectured, but they also gave me a tour of the facility uh, and, and gave advice to the medical department. What are the barriers to program development? It's not just in my field, but in other fields too. Lack of manpower. I just told you that there's not enough occupational physicians, but uh, we don't educate even regular physicians in the field, and we don't hear uh, in India use alternative models uh, like we do in other places. Uh, Physicians in general, as I already said, don't want to engage in compensation. So you have to recognize that if you're going to think about an occupational health program, compensation evaluations or legal evaluations are a part of that. Um, there's lack of government concern. The government doesn't particularly care if this gets done, especially here. But it, uh, uh, at times can be difficult but not impossible to generate income. Um, at the university where I am now, Drexel, when I was a professor of medicine starting there, I said to them, why don't we set up an occupational clinic here, which we did. Uh, I had another colleague, so he and I did the occupational medicine. It operated for a number of years, and then one day they came to us and said, we're closing the clinic. And they said, why? It's not making enough money. That's a strange answer. I mean, I can understand closing a clinic that's not making money, but not making enough money, uh, especially in America, was an odd answer. So importance of leadership is important and that's why you are going to be the leaders and the leading institutions and uh, you know, if I've left you with any thought that there's this whole other world out there of occupational issues uh, that you might think about, uh, you know, the environment gets to be a bigger issue. There's not much as a hospital administrator that you can do about air pollution. Uh, but you can think about how you can operate your own hospitals to have clean indoor air, for example. That's where uh, people like Dr. Singh become important, as they can advise you about that. So that's the thoughts I wanted to leave you with today, and I'm more than happy to have any comments, questions. Uh, tell me what uh, doesn't work here. Uh, tell me what...